Great. Yeah. Hi, friends. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the Philosophy and Social Sciences Meets Community Panel. Um, I'm Casey, and I'll be moderating today. And just to start off, would love to introduce some of our lovely panelists. Uh, to start, we've got Lisa Khan, formerly of Facebook, MIT Media Lab, and the Obama campaign, and is currently the founder of Icebreaker, which is one of the hottest new community tools out there. Um, I believe the ComChat folks are doing a couple um, networking events using Icebreaker today and tomorrow, so highly recommend checking it out if you haven't yet. Um, next, we've got Eric Martin, who is the former head of community at WeWork and Reddit, and is currently the head of community at Teal, which is playing a special role helping people through career transitions, particularly during the pandemic. And finally, last but not least, we have Michael Martin, who heads up community efforts at SignalFire. And SignalFire, if you've not heard of it, is a data-driven VC fund where community building is the heart of what they do. And anecdotally, I've heard it is one of the hottest checks in the Valley over the last year or two. So really excited to be here with them all. Um, you don't know me, my name is Casey. I formerly founded a company called Hacker Paradise and been doing a lot of random things in the community world since then. Um, but to jump, jump, right, jump right in, we've got around 25 minutes left in the time. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the world that makes community a really hot topic. Um, and I think to start, you know, this whole conference is around building community, building strong communities. And strong communities can be both healthy and unhealthy and can be kind of good for the world and less good for the world. Um, there's the saying that the most segregated time on Sunday morning in the world is Sunday mornings when people are at church. Mm -hmm. And so as community builders, um, what kind of responsibility do you think we have for helping to bridge people across those lines and not just um, build kind of monocultures? And, and how would you recommend people do that? And I'm going to let people jump in freely unless that gets complicated and, and then I'll moderate more intensively. I think um, something essential to question right now is what what do we mean by community? Right? Are we talking about community as like our community of peers within our startup space? Is it our community that we live, place-based community that we live in that we no longer have access to due to lockdown and here in Los Angeles curfew? Um, and is it our community at church? Right? I think the, the, like something of, as a background as a community organizer and city planner and now working in a completely different world that takes community to mean other things, I think it's super essential for us to delineate on terms. Um, so, you know, my, my take at the very least on that question is really that if we're taking, thinking about community as an oper as an opportunity and community organizers and builders as an opportunity to, um, you know, help bring people together, I don't think that there's a more important person or a more important role, um, today. Um, our, our feckless leaders have demonstrated how feckless they are. Um, and if it's not us, then who? So that's yeah. all. I'll leave, leave it there. There's more that other folks can say, certainly. No, I think that's totally right. I want to offer sort of a reframe to the question away from the word community into communities. Um, Cause I think that's sort of the sort of the answer, you know, we all have within us multiple identities and we all have the capability of belonging to a lot of different kinds of groups, a lot of different kinds of communities. Um, and something that's happened you know, I think the topic here is like social science. If you look at the social science over the last, you know, certainly the last 20 years, but you can really go back 60 years, there's been a real flattening of individual identity such that people have one identity that matters to them. Um, and in the US context, that tends to be your political identity. It tends to be, if I know how you vote, I know a lot about you, I know where you probably live or a range of places that you can live. I know what TV shows you like, I know what news you trust. Um, I know what platforms you prefer. I know how much time you spend on them. And so what happens is if you only have one identity that matters to you, you're really only in one community. And any threat to that community or to that identity or any perceived threat is a threat to your very existence. Um, and so I sort of propose that we as platform creators and people who study community and people who build community, that we think about helping folks find and build meaningful relationships in multiple, multiple communities along multiple different dimensions. And when that happens, it may be that I'm a Democrat, and Michael, I don't think you are, but I'm just gonna use you as an example. And, and Michael's a Republican. I loved Hillary Clinton in 2016. Michael loved Trump. We might, in that part of our identity, really be in conflict and really have some major issues, but we both live in Los Angeles. Um, and that's sort of a connector identity that we can build common ground, uh, empathy and understanding around. And so um, I think a lot about how do we 
help people organically, authentically join, find meaning, meaning in, find a sense of belonging in multiple kinds of communities that align, align with the multiple dimensions of all of our identities. Yeah, I would, Lisa, I totally agree with that. And I think one as sort of, uh, especially if you're working with a community that has, uh, you know, some sort of scale um, and you're thinking about how to design and cultivate um, spaces where people can, you know, uh, uh, you know, express different different parts of their identity and, and be in different communities, it's really important to think about a range of, of sizes of those spaces. So, you know, going back to the, you know, the classic community social science text of bowling alone, um, you know, it's important to have spaces that are, you know, sort of in that in-between size. It's not the entire community. It's not the close-knit tiny circle where people are already comfortable in sort of uh, interactions, but it's that medium space that's not, you know, that's not too big or, or too small where people can uh, uh, meet people from those different smaller sort of social circles or interest circles or whatever. Um, so really important to sort of be intentional about those, especially the sort of medium meta type spaces where sort of cross pollination and multi people can even show up with multiple identities. Um, and then the other thing I'd say really important is, again, especially if you're dealing with a community of scale, is to make sure internally you have some sort of mechanism to see your blind spots in terms of what, what people are, you know, both, you know, positive and negative things people are doing in the community. Uh, if you're working with a community of scale, there becomes a point really quick where you can't be aware of everything that's going on. So you have to come up with mechanisms to, you know, surface uh, things that don't come to you. Um, it's easy to spend all your time just dealing with the people that are messaging you and contacting you or that, you know, have a lot of uh, uh, attention on them in the sort of community space. So, you know, in, important to figure out how do you, you know, it could be random, just, you know, a, a mechanism to randomly visit five different spaces in your community or check in with five different members um, that that aren't sort of raising their hand or contacting you every day. And I think, you know, long term, those type of, uh, uh, you know, listening mechanisms can can really yield uh, amazing results. Great. You spent a whole bunch of time in the early days of Reddit. And Lisa, I know you've done a lot of research around um, how people, uh, particularly in the last election, were quite siloed in their information architecture. And I'm curious, um, you know, particularly for both of you and, and also, Michael, from your experience um, working with the government um, and the housing department, and I'm curious, how do you feel, what do you think platforms can really do to help bridge the gaps between um, some of these different um, silos or watering holes when it might not be kind of um, in someone's intuitive uh, or it might not be their first step to go across the line of difference and build a connection? I think it's really, really tricky. And we are seeing, you've seen that play out in all of the large platforms. Eric, I'm really interested in how at Reddit you thought about this. Um, I'll just introduce her to uh, features that I worked on um, while I was at the MIT Media Lab focused on Twitter specifically. Um, both are based in, um, in data science and in um, behavioral psychology. So one thing that we built was called Flipfeed. And it sort of was based off of this concept of contact theory, that if you have some exposure to someone who you view as the other, who you view as different from you, um, there's a tremendous impact on you and on other people in your life, actually, to have more empathy and understanding for those folks. So we built a Twitter plugin called Flipfeed that allowed you to literally step into someone else's Twitter feed. Um, and so you would hit a button and it would flip your feed. And you didn't know if you were looking at someone who was really far away from you on the ideological spectrum, really close to you, and you saw every single tweet that they would see. And it wasn't just political nonsense. It was, oh, this person follows the tourism bureau of Montreal. And you realize, oh, I love Montreal. I love bagels. You know, I have this in common um, with this person. And, and we did a lot of analysis of what is the impact that that has on um, people's own sort of sense of the other. And one of the questions that we asked was, would you like to meet this person? Um, and pretty much exclusively the answer was yes. The other one that I'll offer, um, there's a lot of research that suggests that if people know sort of how far away they are in the information ecosystem from other groups or other clusters or other silos, they do tend to self-correct. Uh, and so we also built something when I was at MIT um, that allowed you to see where you were in the Twitter sphere. And you might realize you're actually really far away from the norm or from the average or from another tribe. And then it recommended people you could follow to move your overall kind of media diet a little bit more to become a little bit more balanced. Um, so those are just two 
uh, ideas that I'll recommend, but like it's it's it, these these choices often come into conflict with engagement and policy interests, and uh, are, are certainly very tricky. Yeah, and I would say, um, I mean, yeah, with Reddit, we thought a lot about again those those different the different types of communities people would be in. So, you know, if you're in a a uh, uh, explicitly political you know subreddit or community. You know, there's some exceptions, but for the most part, that's not where a lot of uh, you know cross pollination and and minds are going to be changed. Um, but if you look at something like the DIY community or some of the sports communities or some of the communities around certain you know TV shows or movies or video game franchises that attract you know a diverse audience, like those you know maybe not quite at the at the you know surface uh, uh, level, but in the comments, then you'll see a lot of sort of people uh, who know they have something shared that they both love or both like or are both a part of, uh, it's a much different type of discussion than you'd find in the political space. Um, and I think too, it's important to like constantly, constantly remind people and sort of prime them to think about those things they have in common. So one of the things I love about Icebreaker is, is the way they design their questions. Um, so I think if I'm remembering correctly, there's a bunch of questions in the sort of getting to know you flow about your hometown. And memories you have about your hometown. What's a food that reminds you of your hometown? What's a you know mistaken stereotype people have about your hometown? And like everyone loves talking about that. Um, so that's like a shared thing uh, in sort of both internal Slack communities, you know, at work that I'm a part of, and also in our uh, Slack community for Teal members. We encourage people to share awkward childhood photos as one of their first things, or even as their as their uh, uh, you know icon photo. Uh, because I don't know, it's just it, you know, at, at a company, if you're having an argument or debate with somebody on on Slack that's a coworker, it's just you get slightly less mad at them when their icon is a picture of them when they were eight and awkward, or you know, an awkward picture at their you know middle school prom or whatever. Um, and when you're meeting new people in a, in a, a, for example, a Teal in one of our job search cohorts, uh, getting to know someone uh, when they tell you about what they're doing juxtaposed with a picture of them when they were a kid is just you know, you're kind of seeing them uh, from a couple different perspectives at the same time, which, which you know, only goes so far, but it at least starts you thinking about them as a, as a you know, nuanced, unique individual like we all are. Um, I, I want to, Eric, you're so good at being a ray of sunshine. Um, so I'm going to uh, veer us back to something that was a little less sunshiny, what Lisa said, and I think it's really uh, important is that, um, and you touched on it briefly at the end there, Lisa, is that like, you know how can how can platforms play a role? Um, they should readjust and potentially demolish the business model as it currently stands, right? Like Facebook isn't an advertising company, and Facebook is not interested in us getting along per se. That's a nice byproduct, um, but at the end of the day, if Facebook sees their engagement drop, they're going to redefine their products and their algorithms in such a way that increases engagement and. What are the things that increase engagement in 2020 in America? I think we know what those things are. Uh, and it's not necessarily pictures of puppies, which drive a lot of my engagement, but not everyone's. Um, so I think it's something that like, you know, we, we really can't divorce um, individual actions and uh, thoughts from really the things that drive uh, revenue and stock price. Um, and I think that that's like super important for us to not lose sight of when we're thinking about what role platforms play and, you know, having people come together, but also like facilitate democracy or not. Great, great. Um, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of um, both the challenge and maybe the rewards of really creating a sense of shared community or shared humanity amongst members and other things. Um, and it does sound like both from some of what Lisa and Eric, you said, and also about Michael, there's this sense of, um, noticing the places where there's going to be conflict and where there are the places where bridging can happen. Um, great, well, shifting gears a little bit. I know, um, Michael, you've done some work outside of Signal Fire with Free Machine, which is kind of organizing um, events and think taking for um, around the future of tech and how that might impact humanity um, and, and policy. And Lisa, I know you've done some stuff with Forward US. I'm curious, um, what have you guys seen and learned from the political organizing world in that, that world that has informed um, your work in the community world? Do you want to go ahead, Lisa? You go first. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, so my sort of roots of my career in political organizing, my grandmother was an activist in the civil rights era, and I've been doing that a lot. 
particularly recently. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a bunch of things that um, are misconceptions actually about what political organizing is about. I think when you think about political organizing, you think it's all about the change that you're trying to accomplish, the candidate you're trying to get into office, the policy that you want passed, the number of votes that you need to do both of those things. And those things certainly guide the strategy. Um, but at the end of the day, it is sort of the, the leaders that you empower and the infrastructure of people who have the tools, the training, the belief in themselves to do amazing things that last far beyond any election cycle or any policy outcome. Um, so I worked on the Obama campaign, for example, and I was in Florida in 2012. And when I was hired, there was really no infrastructure just yet. It was, it was a year prior to election day. And I saw my vote goal. I don't remember now what it was. It was like, I mean, like 500,000 votes or something by election day. And that meant I had to persuade X number of people, like that times three. And um, and so the first thing I did was I started building community among people who were passionate about President Obama. And I trained them with all the skills I had been trained and trained them to train other people and so on and so forth. And the reason that I, that I share that is we won Florida, we won the election, but it's been, you know, He's been out of office now for a while. That election ended and, and his term ended. Um, and those women that I, mostly women, that I organized, trained, empowered are still in South Florida, still doing the same work um, because they found community, belonging, purpose. They gave something. They got something in return. And it, it, outlasted, it outlasted the goals, the outcomes that we were trying to accomplish. Um, the outcomes and the goals you know, drove, I think, their sense of empowerment. And it framed and guided how we did training. Um, but we built community, is what we did. We built lasting, real, authentic, genuine community with norms and rituals and stories and leaders. Um, and so I think a lot of folks here probably work in a like for-profit context where you're building community among customers or um, ambassadors, folks like that. And I would encourage you to think of it as the same way. Like your you know, business goals are equal to vote goals. Um, but ultimately what you're trying to do is create layers of leadership and empower people and connect them to each other and help them see themselves and their real potential. Yeah, I, I mean, I would 100% echo what Lisa said. I mean, ultimately, political and community organizing is just about empowering other people. Um, like, at the end of the day, you may be an expert, um, but expertise can only bring you so far. Um, like, and you're and you can only shout so loud, or you know, you don't scale, right? And put it in the business sense, you don't scale. So, how do you scale? Uh, will you have to train other people to run with your message and scale it for you? And you know, in a political context, that means getting candidates through a door or passing a legislation around a specific issue. Um, in a business context, that is perhaps your community of users, right? And like, the, what's the things that's going to make your users want to become um, your champions? Like products that delight them and make their lives easier, right? But you can't understand, similarly in a way that you can't understand the thing that's going to drive um, someone to the polls um, without asking them, you can't understand what's going to turn your users or your own community into champions unless you figure out the things that are making their lives hard and giving them a like those features to alleviate that pain and then giving them assets and their own a platform to then let them run with it and share it themselves. Mm, that's and one of the things I'm hearing actually is is um you know in the kind of framing of the question is this sense of there are these really meaningful things that happen by nature of most political act of organizing being volunteer and then we can we can translate to for-profit um and all three of you from, from what i understand now are primarily working on for-profit businesses right signal fire icebreaker teal um lisa and michael you guys have done some more organizing stuff in the past we're still doing that on the side eric what you're working on now seems at least from the outside to be very much like a social enterprise like a very kind of mission oriented company and i'm curious do you think and this came up a little bit in our pre-panel discussion do you think there's a difference um in like the flavor of community when it's for-profit versus non-profit and how when you're working on for-profit um, communities how do you um balance perhaps the needs of the um, you know, the, the stock price, if you will, even if it's private, um, with kind of the broader community measures. I mean, I'll just say this is, um, I really appreciate the question and this is sort of exactly what we at Icebreaker are sort of trying to figure out. Um, so far, and we're still pretty early, we haven't had to make those, those trade-offs just yet. Um, but I have 
you know, a lot of like documents where I have these aspirational goals that say like icebreaker is going to be like a community led company and we're community first as opposed to customer first or product first or design first. Um, and so, yeah, I actually, part of the reason that I love this community and I love the CMX community, there's sort of a handful of um, professional community builders. I, 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 this is actually an area of, I really, really want to learn from, from all of you um, and from those of you who are watching today. So I'll kind of shut up and listen on this one. Michael, anything to, to I, chime in? I don't know. I don't know how you, I mean, I, I know that at the longer your horizon, I think the more, the more those two things, the the sort of health of the community and the health of the of the business, uh, you know, sort of naturally align. But I, I think it's really tough. I think, um, you know, it's also, I don't know, there's, there's all these inherent tensions, um, you know, that also I think having multiple revenue streams gives you some more options to, uh, if you're a for-profit company or even a nonprofit, multiple sources of, of, uh, of, of capital like helps you or multiple funding sources. It just gives you more optionality, but then you're splitting your focus. You're splitting your attention. You have more things to manage. Um, so that's another inherent tension that I think is, I've found practically to be related a lot. Um, I don't know. I wish there were more, you know, there were better models that we could all follow. Um, but it's, it's definitely a just constant, I think built in, built in tension uh, as far as I've seen. Bad. No, not real. I mean, ultimately, like, yeah, it's they're, they're very difficult things to balance. Um, and you know, if you really want to focus on, you know, community, and you know, uh, if you want to focus on community and community first, then you're going to need to make sure from a from a business side that your you know your uh, value proposition to your investors or to your customers is aligned with that as opposed to kind of having it be a separate thing that you do. Because at the end of the day, like it's going to, I mean, Lisa knows this from building a company that's community first, right? If, if you don't convince your investors on the front end that this is going to be the thing that drives the success of your business and your business will, will thrive or fail on this, then it's gonna be the first thing on the chopping block when you don't meet your ARR for, or your MRR yeah. for Q1. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add on that. I do think that um, business model and sort of pricing model need to be very aligned with the goals and the interests of community and not have your sort of pricing model be a tax on better or more community. You know, and this is, we're, we're honestly still figuring out our exact pricing model. And um, and this is the thing about all the time. Like we do not want to penalize people who do better and more community building, right? Through, through a pricing model, which is uh, tricky. Especially when they're yeah. hard costs. Yeah, when they're, exactly. So, right, like AWS yeah. is, is right. done. <laughs> It's gonna be more expensive for you if you get too big. So, cool. Um, I'm realizing we only have a few minutes left before we've got to make space for the next speaker. And I'm curious. You know, most of you came, started your career, not as explicit community folks. Um, you know, communities of field wasn't necessarily around uh, a little while ago. And um, you know, nowadays there's conferences like this. There's books. You know, Colonel Bacon. There's Melissa Jones, there's, uh, you know, the get together folks, there's lots of people writing out this is more of a defined field, but I'm curious, you know, particularly in the early days, even now, are there any resources, books, or other um, concepts that have really been meaningful for you and how you think about community that have come from other worlds? Um, yeah, maybe like a parting resource uh, share with, with. I mean, I think we all lose our community credentials if we don't all in unison suggest bowling alone. Uh, by Robert Putnam, who I had the pleasure, I've had several conversations with him, you guys, if you ever want to talk about that, he's amazing and very old and incredible. Um, and had a lot of interesting things to say about sort of the bridge between offline and online community. And he used the term that I'll pass along to everyone here that it's an alloy, it's a new kind of metal. He found that the, this idea that we have online versus offline and they're two separate form, forms of community to be just, he rejected that concept. And so you know, he calls it two different metals and have come together to form an alloy. So. I'll take the easy one first and say "Well, and alone, which I'm sure is everyone's answer. Glad you suggested it because I have something in hey, mind completely different. So my suggestion, yeah, so my suggestion is um, Rules for yeah. Radicals by yeah. Saul Alinsky. Um, like, if you really want to understand, you know, the basics of how do you get people 
to do something for you that they basically it's probably aligned with them. They may just not know it. Like you need mm -hmm. to read this book. I mean, Sally Linsky was the father of community organizing in the 1960s when you really start to saw this and any community organizer worth their salt today really is, you know, looking to him, looking to, you know, in the current moment, looking to the Black Panther Party similarly. So these are kind of like the essential texts of community organizing. So if you're looking to go uh, learn from other fields, uh, I don't know how relevant it is, but I kind of recommend you read them regardless. Yeah, I would add uh, Emergent Strategy by uh, Adrian Marie Brown. Um, really good, especially like, I don't know, I, that's my favorite part of working with communities is seeing the, the things that emerge from the community itself. And that book has a lot of, you know, very practical and, and also like more sort of uh, abstract frameworks for how to how to think about and encourage and, and uh, work with, you know, emergent, emergent behavior, um, which is super relevant for communities. So recommend that one. Great. Um, well, I realize that's right about time, and I just want to say thank you, Lisa, Eric, Michael, for taking the time and for being part of the, the summit. Um, hope everyone uh, watching enjoyed. Thanks, all. Bye.